Welcome to the Dixie Cryptid channel. Today's video is going to be a little different. The story's a little different in that the man who wrote this is a skeptic. If we're going to use our critical thinking skills, we have to listen to every side, every view, every theory on these creatures. I mean, in a world where no one listens to anyone, everyone is just screaming in the other's face, I think it's a good time to sit back and just listen to another point of view. But he actually does have a Bigfoot story at the end. It's going to be a long video. This is all written by one man. And I hope you appreciate and enjoy what he's written because it's really good. So pull up a chair to this virtual kitchen table or unfold your lawn chair around our campfire, crack you a beer, pour you a cup of coffee, snuggle up with someone you love, and let's just all get along and have a great time listening to some stories. Are y'all ready? All right, here we go. I'm not going to tell you the man's name, but I'll tell you this. He's a real, really nice guy. We've had a couple of email exchanges, and this is actually a cryptid channel, but this is a case against Bigfoot. It, it's not really a case against Bigfoot, but it's like, well, let me just get into his letter, and you guys decide for yourself. But I'll say this. He has a lot of the opinions that I share I'd first like to say that I've listened to many of your YouTube shows. I find most of the stories fascinating, and I believe that the people who send the stories are obviously true believers. That's a tricky word when it comes to Sasquatch. I'm writing to you today as, I guess, more of a researcher than a skeptic. My daughter, who has never seen a Sasquatch but is a firm believer, has told me that I am a skeptic. I will explain my skepticism, which is the main reason for this letter. First, I believe it to be imperative that you know a little background on me in order to give credence to what I'm about to tell you. I'm 61 years old. I come from Native American and Irish blood. My father was the definition of an outdoorsman. He had me fishing at three years old and hunting since I was big enough to keep both ends of a rifle or a shotgun off the ground at the same time. My dad, my brother, and I spent weeks at a time back in the wilderness areas of the Colorado Rockies camping, hunting, or hiking, and just enjoying each other. Other times, we packed up mom and my two sisters, and the whole family would go camping and fishing on Grand Mesa or the headwaters of the Rio Grande River near Creed, Colorado. My dad, my brother, and I also provided for the family by hunting. Dad was the type who, if I missed a shot, he wanted to know why, and wounding an animal was looked down on so much that we learned young that we never shot unless we were sure and we were to never, ever miss. As I grew up, I began trapping to supplement the family's income and continued all of these activities until adulthood. I've taught trapping, tracking, and wilderness survival and made somewhat of a local name for myself tracking animals, lost people, and a couple of times even criminals on the run back in the mountains. I was a freelance contract predator controller for the Colorado Division of Wildlife for seven and a half years before I moved to Wyoming. While taking assignments from Division of Wildlife, I was sent after problem animals and into problem areas where certain animals were overpopulated or causing problems. I was called a predator controller but I also trapped numerous beaver in areas where they were overpopulated. I've worked as a firefighter, both structural and wildland, and contracted as a timber sawyer with the National Forest Service, for whom I fought six forest fires, including four of the five fires in Yellowstone during the horrible 1988 fire season. I also put myself through college working as a sawyer, logging in the Pacific Northwest. I've spent many years in the wilderness areas of Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and Washington in four separate mountain ranges. 
I currently reside back in the front range of Colorado, approximately 12 miles southwest of Pikes Peak. I live in an area where most sightings of Sasquatch have been reported in Colorado. I've spent an incredible amount of time in the Washington Cascade Range working as a timber sawyer or just wandering. This is also an area with the most reported sightings in that state. I've also spent weeks or months at a time in several ranges in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. I've searched for and hoped for a Bigfoot sighting. I looked in areas where I was most likely to have a sighting, according to past reports, and searched intently for the sign. As of today, I have seen nothing that would indicate a 4 to 800 pound, 8 to 9 foot tall primate was living in or had been active in the areas that I've been. Elk hunters have a saying, if there's fresh elk, there's fresh sign. If there's no fresh sign, there's no fresh elk. I feel that would definitely apply to a 400 to 800 pound primate as well. I'm a professional tracker with a lifetime of hunting game. I can track a mouse or a lizard. Yet in all my travels in the mountains in all of these states, where they are supposed to be the most sighted, I have never once, to my dismay, seen a Sasquatch track, a Sasquatch bed, kill, cache, or even any scat. The other thing I'd like to point out is I can look at a dead animal and tell you 100% of the time what killed it. These skills were taught to me as a child, reinforced as I grew up, and used and expanded on literally my entire life. I practiced them any time I possibly could, almost to the point of obsession. I used these skills as an adult when trapping, hunting, or evaluating an area for possible overpopulation issues and animal damage. I can evaluate forage requirements in an area for whatever critters may reside there. As an adult, I have never seen a kill where I couldn't identify the killer, and I've never seen a kill that could have possibly been attributed to a Bigfoot. I have only heard one sound back in a wilderness area once where I couldn't immediately identify what made it. That happened when I was 18 years old, trapping Bobcat way back in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, and sounded for all the world like a woman screaming bloody murder in the middle of a night when the temperature was around minus 34 degrees Fahrenheit. It scared the pants off me because I thought a woman was being killed back in the mountains. I should have known better, but I climbed out of my bed in my little lean-to, and I grabbed my rifle and off snuck through the trees in the pitch-black night to look for who was being killed. That was the night that I learned that a cougar can sound just like a woman screaming as it echoes through the mountains. There again, it was eventually identified. I've listened very closely to the descriptions of behaviors of Bigfoot that have been encountered. I must say that many of the behaviors I've heard described are behaviors that are aberrant for any wild animal, yet the folks who have had the encounters also report some behaviors that would be considered typical for a large primate, but could be picked up just by watching Animal Planet or National Geographic. Bigfoot making so much noise just going through the forest doesn't make sense for any wild animal, especially for an animal that hunts other critters for their part of their diet. I've witnessed bears plowing through the brush making a racket after being surprised or scared, yet the same bear will slip through the woods nearly as silent as a cat when it is hunting. The branch or log breaking or beating a log against a tree are behaviors typical of large gorillas when they feel threatened or are trying to establish dominance. They don't perform these behaviors, however, just for giggles or to call in other gorillas. I can't make heads or tails of these behaviors from any primate who should be fairly silent unless given a reason for the described behaviors. Last, I am also well-read and experienced in what different critters eat and how much forage it takes for an animal or herd of animals to proliferate, not just survive. If these Sasquatch are what everyone describes, then they are a primate and possibly even Australopithecine or Sapien of some sort. 
This means they are indeed omnivores, but likely to live more on plant matter than meat. If typical, their diet would consist of 85% to 90% plants, roots, fruits, seeds, and berries. On the other hand, if these animals are most likely predatory, I should have run across ample sign of their kills and or partially eaten animals. I should have also ran across scat. I believe their scat would be easily discernible from a bear, a cat, or any type of wild canine. I have never run across their scat, whether meat or plant matter. I have also never found any area in any of the mountain ranges I've wandered that had adequate forage to support a single 400 to 800 pound primate, much less a family or a herd. I believe I need to believe in God. I need to believe in love. Children probably need to believe in the magic of Santa and the Easter Bunny, but I don't think I need to believe in an animal. To just believe in Bigfoot means to me something that is paranormal and is not necessarily seen. This is troubling to me. I can't abide a thought process that eventually comes to, I believe, therefore they exist. I'm writing to you as you have obviously read hundreds of encounters, and I believe I've heard you say that you have actually had an encounter of some sort with one of these animals. Can you help me with these problems, please? (laughs) There's a letter from a skeptic. Now, I'm about to read the second email I got from him, which actually has an encounter story. I think you're going to enjoy it. But first, the last paragraph of his email. No, I've never had an encounter. And to the writer here, I'm just like you. I have never. Now, I'm not as woodsy as you are. I'm just the occasional weekend hunter. Although the last seven or eight years, I've spent a lot of time in the woods not hunting, just kind of hanging out, doing a little pond fishing, walking my dogs and stuff like that. But I'm like you. I've been in the woods a lot. But I've never seen anything or heard anything, anything that sounds or looks or would make me think there's an animal in those woods that is anything other than the normal animals that we see. So I'm like the writer, but that does not mean I don't think something is out there. And because the stories are so numerous and they're so great that I think people are encountering something. I mean, they're encountering something in these woods. The stories are, for the most part, believable, and I enjoy them. But I know exactly what this man is saying. We hear all of this stuff, all of these YouTube channels showing evidence, uh, uh, YouTube channels like mine telling stories. We've got documentary after documentary on these things. The heck, there's even TV. There's several TV series on them. With all of that evidence and all of that hoopla over Bigfoot throughout the last couple of centuries, you would think there would be sign of these things everywhere, but there isn't. There isn't. And so maybe you have to have a real keen eye or not. But this this man right here, he's been in the woods a long time and done a lot of stuff, and he watches animals. Nobody knows animals better than a hunter or a trapper. If you spend a lot of time with them, you're going to learn how these animals behave. And so I thought I would read that skeptic's letter because I think it's important that we look and listen to all viewpoints. And you know that probably 90% of the population of this country, really the world who is exposed to the topic of Bigfoot, don't believe it's real. They don't believe it's real because they've never seen anything like it. Matter of fact, they laugh at it. So I think a skeptic's point of view is important. So right now we're going to move on to the second email that he sent me. I'm sorry to keep talking, but I just thought this whole thing was interesting and worth sharing with y'all. So hold on here. We're going to, we're going to get into his story. Okay, here is the writer's story, the skeptic story that's actually an encounter story. Now, when I get to the end, you guys kind of make your own decision what's going on here. But here's what he writes. I never could get straight in my own head why it was so important for me to prove that these things could not exist in the mountains of the West, whether it be Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, or Washington. I have looked and looked for some proof of their existence. 
I listened to your recording of Mike, the Colorado rancher and outfitter, talk about his encounters and issues with these critters, and it kind of jogged loose a memory from way back when I was a teenager. So I decided, since I reached out with my doubt, I would now reach out with my story, and I hope you enjoy it. This event happened in 1975. I was raised in a family that was very much an outdoor camping, hunting, and fishing family, and also very active in our church. Every year from the time my two sisters, one brother, and myself, I'm the youngest, became of junior high school age, we worked all year at different jobs that kids of that age usually acquire to pay our own way to Woodbine Ranch, a wonderful Christian young people's camp in the mountains southwest of Sedalia, Colorado. This camp was incredible. It was the ultimate in mountain paradise for a Colorado mountain boy like me. The lodge was actually a series of log buildings built into the side of the mountain. On the top level was a beautiful chapel built of log and large native rock. At the front was a rock fireplace that would hold a six-foot log. Walking out of the chapel, we would travel old west-style boardwalks with lodgepole pine handrails that led to other parts of the lodge. Walking down the walkway, we came next to a huge kitchen and attached dining hall. Then down a short flight of log steps where the classrooms, the camp store, the dispensary, and several large meetings and prayer rooms were located. The logs were always kept in perfect condition and the finish was always glowing. A line of tiny blue lights ran on the ceiling down the length of the hallway that came on at night and let off a soft blue light that was only visible for a short distance. When we made it to junior high school, we volunteered to work at the camp for the entire summer. We received room and board in addition to a lot of fresh air, sunshine, and a chance to help in the running of a wonderful Christian camp, and we couldn't wait to work our humps off as drovers, maintenance people, or wranglers. The week that I finished my junior high year, I headed to camp for the summer to work. We had two weeks to open up the camp before the campers arrived. That year, I was to be the head wrangler, and I was very excited about that job. From the first time that I was a camper at Woodbine Ranch, I had heard stories of the Woodbine Monster. The stories were told by the staff as we campers sat around campfires in the evenings. I always thought that they were like the ghost stories that adults or teens tell younger kids to spook them. The stories were told by staff members who claimed to have experienced a close call with the monster and had barely gotten away with his or her life. The storyteller would go into great detail about their harrowing experience and vividly describe a creature that seemed to grow bigger, hairier, roar louder, and smell worse with each telling and each passing year until it was eventually more than 15 feet tall. It had brown or black hair depending on the teller and the mood of the night. They described huge gorilla-like teeth with the exception of having pronounced upper and lower canines. With each telling of the story, the teeth grew as long as bowie knives and they dripped blood. I got great entertainment as I watched the other kids' bug-eyed reactions to these stories. There were several of us country kids that returned to the camp year after year. We would sit together and laugh while we watched the spooked looks of the city kids as they listened to the monster stories. It was all good-natured in the teasing, but the city kids needed someone to walk them to their respective cabins while they peered off in the dark woods and we figured wanting their mommies. It was great fun for us. I was eventually hired on as staff at the ranch and I never gave the stories a thought because by then I was very familiar with the wild places and the creatures that lived there. The summer started and we got the cabins and the camp ready within our two-week deadline. We had all become good friends and those first two weeks of preparation were always fun. A couple of days before campers began to arrive, the whole crew drove 20 miles away to a place called Johnson's Corner. They had one of the rare and still operational soda fountains. All of it was made with homemade ice cream. 
the entire crew would go for one last thing for ourselves before the campers arrived, but on this day, I couldn't go. I was the head wrangler and still had to open areas where we took our campers on horseback rides. After four hours, I had made it to one of the sites that we usually stop to have lunch. I tied Comet, my quarter horse, off, and then the rest of my pack stock. It was late when I finished the job that I had to do, so I stayed the night at this camp. I built a small fire to ward off the chill of the spring nights at this elevation. I ate a couple of biscuits that I had in my saddlebag, and I snuggled down into my bedroll to catch a couple of hours shut-eye. Around three in the morning, I was awakened to the sounds of all hell breaking loose with the horses. It was a very dark night with no moon. Even the starlight was muted by the thin layer of clouds. In fact, it was so dark that I had a difficult time making out the shapes of the horses. I quickly put on my headlamp, which didn't provide a lot of help because the light was incandescent and my batteries were shot. I could make out one of the pack horses tied to the tree where I left her. She was alternately pulling and fighting against her halter rope and beating her head against the tree. The other pack horse was gone. I assumed that she was headed back down the trail towards the Woodbine Ranch main camp and the safety of her corral. That is where I hoped that she was headed. She could have been critter killed and laying in the bush somewhere, or she could very well step on her long halter rope while running which would likely have broken her neck. I just hoped for the best, and I tried to calm the mare who was still tied with me. I didn't see Common at first, but as I worked to calm the pack horse, I heard him thrashing about a few yards from my camp. So I snugged up the mare's rope, and I went to check on Comet. I soon found out that he had thrown himself down on his side while fighting the hobble. As I approached him, he began to let out a sound that I can only call as a scream and thrashing wildly. I approached, talking softly to him, trying to calm him so I could undo the hobble and get him up. Calming him wasn't easy, and I began wondering if a predator had spooked him and was still close by. I fingered my Ruger Blackhawk 45 Colt in its holster just to assure myself that it was still there, but hoping that I would have no reason to skin it. I had very powerful loads in the pistol designed for grizzly, so I figured it would be plenty to stop a marauding black bear or cougar bent on having a little horse meat for a late night dinner. After a lot of soft talking and rubbing, I finally had the big quarter horse on his feet and somewhat calmed. I gave him a good going over, and he didn't appear injured other than a couple of skin places on his neck and legs. I was irritated that my other pack horse was gone, but was also really worried about her too. I had seen horses that had run off with the halter rope trailing. All the horse has to do is bring a hoof down on the rope while at a dead run, and it will snap the horse's neck like a dry stick. So I gathered up the remaining pack animal, and I headed down the trail towards camp, and the direction that I was sure the missing horse had gone. I don't mind saying that I was a little nervous because I was pretty sure that a bear had caused the whole scene back where I was bedded down. I double-checked the 45 at my hip, making sure that it was loaded. I had never been afraid of bears because I had hunted them with my father. I do, however, have a great respect for their power. I think that I subconsciously suspected bear because the smell in the air when I was awakened was a little bit skunky and a whole lot like a mix of bear and wolverine. It was bad. I mean, it was really strong. Only a mile down the trail, I spotted the other pack horse standing in the edge of some brush where her rope had become entangled. As we approached, I could see her standing stock still and she was shaking all over. Her eyes were bugged out as horses do when absolutely terrified. Without even thinking about it, the big pistol was in my hand as I scanned all around the big mare for movement that would give away the presence of a predator. I dismounted and approached the big mare slowly, speaking softly, reassurances, and constantly scanning the bush beyond her. I was made more nervous by the fact that Comet was nervous too. With the horses behaving the way that they were and the stench in the air much stronger, 
I decided that morning was a much better time to head up there, and I picked up the ropes of the pack horses, jumped on Comet, and I lit out towards the main camp. I could not get over the stench around these animals. I was thinking that many things smell a bit skunky like foxes and sometimes bear, but this was different and it was much worse. It reminded me of wolverine mixed with skunk mixed with roadkill and it nearly gagged me. I gave Comet his head as I knew he could see better in the dark than I could and he knew the trail back to the camp very well. He started out with his usual gait, slowly having to work around limbs and such, but soon he began to increase his speed. I heard the most strange growl and then a howl that I've ever heard. It was loud enough to wake the dead. In fact, it was so loud that I could feel the sound. Kind of like being real close to a jet engine when it's throttled up. I knew that it was no bear. I laid up over Comet's big neck and let him lead the way. I thought it was so strange and frightening that all the way down the hill, I kept hearing something running a parallel route with us down the mountain, and occasionally I heard a very loud whoop sort of call. Comet kept trying to hurry faster than I considered safe with the overhanging limbs, and I had to rein him in several times, which was unusual for him. The noises and the whoop call kept on until we got back to camp. We all arrived back at the camp much sooner than I expected, and all four of us were sure glad to see the lights in the corral area that were kept on 24-7. Even as I was unburdening and brushing the horses, I kept hearing rustling up around the hill with occasional huffing and grunting, and it was so loud that it felt like the creature was very close. I was now beginning to become unnerved as bad as the horses. I put the tack and the panniers away and headed up to the lodge. The noises never ceased. I slowed long enough to look down the hill behind me, and through the brush I could make out a huge figure of something that was the shape of a massive, hairy football player. When I say massive, I mean nine or ten feet massive. I had to be either hallucinating from exhaustion and fright, or my eyes were playing tricks on me. I wasn't going to take any chances with something that big, and I ran towards the dining hall door. Hurrying into the dining hall, I had to stop just a few seconds to let my eyes adjust to the darker hall. I could hear the huge creature thumping up the boarded walkway that led all the way around the lodge. I began to have memories of the woodbine monster and the similarities of what I had seen. I made an attempt to put these out of my mind, but the images from my childhood kept coming back, and I wondered if some of the earlier stories might possibly be true, or mostly anyway. Whichever was true, it was enough to make my fear grow to an almost freezing terror. But fear or not, I had to keep moving if I was going to get away from whatever was chasing me. As soon as my vision was acclimated to the darkness of the dining hall, I ran towards the only place where I figured the huge creature wouldn't be likely to see me. The dining hall lights were off, but there were large windows about every six feet across the side. There were also power outage batteries mounted on the walls about every ten feet that had tiny lights that indicated that they were charging. I was sure the monster would be able to see me if I remained in the dining hall. I was wishing that the kids who had gone for ice cream would return soon. I ran for the kitchen and slid through the bat wing doors. Once in the kitchen, I noticed that there was a power outage battery mounted in here also. It looked like a spotlight to me, revealing every move that I made. The flower bin caught my eye. I needed a place to hide. It was a large bin made of steel with a sort of chimney so that flour could be dumped inside. The bin had not been filled yet and there was room so I stuffed myself inside the bottom standing in the six or eight pounds of flour that had been left in there. I heard one of the dining hall doors being torn off its hinges and the creature chuffing. Inside, the noise this thing made boomed through the building, shaking the walls. I was crammed into the flower bin, but I could feel it against my head and my chest. I have never been so afraid in my life. Looking back, it almost sounded like the creature was talking and trying to form words. It sounded a bit like the beast was saying, Hey, you, 
very loudly, and it ended with a series of huffs and grunts. I was totally terrified. To make matters even worse, when I tried to draw my big revolver, I found that the little loading chute was too tight for me to reach it. I knew that if the monster found my hiding place, I was a goner for sure. Instead of lowering myself out of the chute, I tried to stop shaking and remain perfectly still. I was even trying to control my breathing. I was sure that he would hear it. I stayed motionless as little bits of flour that clung to the metal joints of the chute fell in my eyes and on my head. I no longer heard the creature moving about and I couldn't hear his chuffing sound. But suddenly the horrible stink that I had smelled on the trail was so strong that I found myself suppressing the urge to gag. I could hear the beast breathing and I could smell its breath. I thought my heart would stop when I heard the scrape of a callous foot against the tile floor right beside the bin. The mixtures of noxious smells made me sick as I fought fear and revulsion in order to stay still and quiet. I saw a sliver of light as the monster silently opened the flower bin lid. My heart nearly stopped as I saw a huge hairy hand reach in and grab my pants leg. And then strangely, as softly as a mother would pick up her newborn babe, he pulled me out of the chute. The flower dust that came out with me actually made the creature sneeze. When he regained his composure, he yelled once again right in my face, Hey, you! As he stared at me with those big, huge, black, ape-like eyes, a huge grin spread across his ugly face, revealing massive yellow teeth. And he said, Tag, you're it. And then he broke into laughter. And then off he ran. That is the tale of the monster of the Woodbine Ranch. It scared the crap out of a bunch of city kids when I told it over a campfire on a dark night. They'd get right to the end peeking out of the dark woods. Only right at the end did they figure out that I might have been pulling their leg. I hope your audience enjoyed this story. Okay, I know that is not the typical story, and we all know that's a campfire story, a real camp campfire story. But I just thought it was great. I thought the man had, a gr had some great points with his skeptical email. And then he shared a story that he shared with the kids that he's managing in these camps. And I really enjoyed it all, and I hope you guys did too. So that's going to do it for this video. It's a long one, but I really enjoyed putting it together. And we'll see you guys on the next video. Thank you.